All right, welcome everybody to the Physio Detective Podcast. I've got Diane Jacobs from Canada uh, with me. We're on the Dermo Neuromodulating course. Um, will you tell us a little bit about you, Diane? Tell us about your history. You're a physio. What should? What do you want people to know about you? Oh, well, um, I am a fairly old physio of a fairly advanced vintage. Uh, graduated in 1971 from the University of Saskatchewan in Canada and have seen things rise and fall and come and go. And, uh, my trajectory has been in the direction of manual therapy since about 1982, 83, sometime in there. And I took a, f uh, a little bit of um, orthopedic manual therapy training in Canada, found I wasn't that fond of it and gravitated more toward um, kind of osteopathic work, the, the slower kind that was more about soft tissue and less about bones and joints. So I ended up following my own uh, nervous system, which that's what it wanted to do. and. Um, that's been the story. I, I found it quite effective and just as effective as any other kind of manual therapy could or would be. Um, found a teacher that I really liked. Uh, he was, his name was, is Lauren Rex and he operated out of something called the Ursa Foundation which was kind of a joke name because his nickname was Bear. He was shaped similar to you actually. And, um, so devilishly good looking, devilish. lots of long flowing hair. Long flowing hair and a ponytail actually, and <laughs> an earring. And um, it, uh, he was a really, really good manual therapy teacher. He was an osteopathic physician from the US who ended up in Regina. That's where I first met him, was in Regina teaching a workshop um, in 1983. And he was such a good teacher that I ended up moving to British Columbia so that I would be close to Washington and be able to go down and take workshops from him specifically um, over the next couple of decades. So yeah, I moved to BC in 83 and stayed there until 2009 and then moved back to Saskatchewan because of the climate being undesirable in Vancouver. Um, and more sunshine available in Saskatchewan. Um, so I've had a private practice since uh, 1994, uh, both in Vancouver and after I moved back to the prairies, I opened another one. Beautiful. And we're on the Dermo Neuromodulating course. Mm -hmm. um, how did you get into teaching? Good question. I didn't ever have any desire or aspiration to teach. I was not a public person. Um, so what, I guess what happened was in 1998, I sat in a class that David Butler was teaching in Vancouver. And he didn't deliberately light a fire under me, but he definitely, some big light bulb came on in my brain about how just about any kind of manual therapy has to do with nerves. It was all of a sudden a nervous system issue. And I, I uh, he was dealing like with long nerves of the arm and leg and stuff. And it was a like neural flossing and then, anyway, that, it, that part didn't turn my crank as much as did the actual neurophysiology of what he was teaching. And I, I immediately thought of cutaneous nerves because a lot of the work I was doing anyhow was about skin and moving skin around. And I thought, jeepers, there's tons of nerves inside skin. How, how does that work? Um, I, I didn't have a clue. There were no papers I could find. I couldn't find anything in anatomy textbooks and I had a bunch of them. I, didn't know, understand. I didn't understand cutaneous nerves and how they got 
through the skin over to the ed the outside of the skin. I knew they got there, but I didn't know how they got out or where how they ended up. You know, and uh, there, were, there weren't there wasn't very much information. I asked the Physiotherapy Association of British Columbia librarian to look for papers for me and he was wonderful. His name was Eugene. Anyway, Eugene had access to all the databases and he looked and looked for all these papers that he could find and there were, he, couldn't, he only found about 15 papers that had to do with cutaneous nerve dissemination and uh, most of them were written by plastic surgeons. Most of them were about the cutaneous nerves of the face and of the breasts because that's kind of what plastic surgeons focus on. They were in, most of them were in German or French, which didn't help me much. And, um, and the drawings in, in the papers were not, not really very clear, not, not very elegant or anything. I didn't understand visually what was going on. Um, I happened to have a opportunity to ask David Butler um, in 2006, I think it was, 2005 or 2006, about cutaneous nerves. And I said, well, what about cutaneous nerves, David? Aren't they important too? And he said, yes, they are. And I said, well, I want to find out about that. He said, well, I said, and I want to write, uh, I want to write something about that. And he said, good. And he said, well, first get a dissection. So just find out where you can go and get a dissector some cutaneous nerves because I think he understood there wasn't much out there about them and so I did uh, I had some backup from uh, Angela Bush at the University of Saskatchewan who is now the head of the school there in physiotherapy she and I had been classmates back in the day and um, so she wrote a letter on my behalf and I took that and I I felt bolstered by David Butler's <laughs> Uh, suggestion and I went to the University of British Columbia <clears throat> and asked them to uh, let me dissect a cutaneous nerve I, uh, kind of stepping out of my comfort zone and so the the um, uh, what are we going to do about that So the, the woman who was the head of the lab at UBC Anatomy Lab was um, an ex-physio and she sat with me for about an hour and she, and, and, I, and she asked me a bunch of questions about why I wanted to do a dissection because I was just basically Jane Blow off the street physio suddenly wanting to do a dissection and this was kind of odd for them and so they wanted to vet me, you know. And, I understand why and everything. Anyway, so I said to her, um, you know, there is this problem with there being no information whatsoever about cutaneous nerves. And from a manual therapy perspective, they are important. It's just that they are unrecognized and they're undocumented and they're unmapped. And we should ought to know about them because that's what we're touching is skin and we're moving those nerves. And there's this whole thing that has opened up about neurodynamics and how that changes uh, neural regulation of everything. And she, and she, uh, she said, well, yeah, that's true. You're right. Yeah. Okay, I'll see what I can do. And she let me go home. And a few months later, she contacted me and said, would you like to come in? And this was now April. We talked in January. And it was now April. She said, would you like to come in Tuesday at 9 o'clock? <laughs> like, holy, yes, absolutely. I cleared my schedule and in I went and, I, and she showed me how to dissect and, and I started working and took about uh, four Tuesdays in a row. Tuesday was the only day she could let me come. So about four Tuesdays it took me to dissect all the nerves of the, uh, upper, of the, uh, of the upper limb on this one guy, one specimen. And um, she thought my work was good. She liked it. They had a no photo policy, which was a bit of an issue for me. I don't, know. I don't care. I'm going to draw them when I'm done. I do have some art training. Anyway, uh, and she, um, 
much, but she looked at the work and she said, this is actually pretty good. You know, what we can do is see if we can waive that policy and maybe we can let you take pictures. So she wrangled it and um, I managed to get a whole bunch of photos of the dissecting that I had done. So I was able to find out that with a, uh, with a opening here and the skin folded back uh, laterally and medially what the nerves were all about inside the arm and the lateral cutaneous nerve of the arm had a long beautifully spaced rami dis um, obliquely disseminating outward to the skin the surface of the skin which meant that the skin was fairly mobile okay and on the medial side of the arm it was less clear okay so the skin and the the skin organ was thinner there and more tightly adhered to the fascia the skin ligaments were more in different directions and uh, so there was a tighter uh, fit and the rami were a lot more higgledy-piggledy and kind of in different directions not so beautifully clear and long and oblique as on the outside of the arm. Anyway, so I dissected all the nerves that I could find and it was a very interesting experience. Um, that was back in 2007. Okay, so that was when my eyesight was still pretty good and um, I and they let me take pictures and so I was happy. So I was able then to take that information and bring it forth. That's the year that people started asking me to teach and I was terrified of teaching. I thought, why would anybody want to know anything that I can't tell them anything they don't already know? And, um, but there was an insistence and I, so I began teaching. The first class I ever taught was just like two people in it. I taught for free. I didn't know what I was doing really. I just kind of bounced along and they were happy with the information and it got me going and got me over my own um, uh, hesitancy. So uh, after that it started to build a little and so I taught a couple more times. 2010 was kind of a watershed moment when I got invited to go to Brazil of all places, Brazil, to speak at a manual therapy, con an international manual therapy conference it was like a big deal. Lots and lots of people, 1,400 people. It was thoroughly intimidating, but I managed to survive that. And also taught a fairly large uh, group of people in a workshop. Um, I had not taught a large group of people before. I'd only taught a couple times prior to that, smaller groups. Anyway, a lot of it had to be translated, and um, so I got way behind, and anyway, whatever, we, we survived. And these were, a lot of them, guys who had been trying to be soccer players, and they'd ended up becoming physios because they got injured and couldn't play soccer. So they became physios instead, and they were all in this class, and they were all kind of interested in this stuff. and. Um, so after that, I thought, oh, okay, I can handle anything. <laughs> you know, it was because it was a long trip, 10 hours in a plane and foreign language and stuff. And they treated me very, very well, I must say. Anyway, so then nothing happened again until about 2012. But it's been really steady teaching ever since 2012. About six, six or seven workshops every single year. And uh, you know, I've kind of gotten over the uh, trauma of it all, <laughs> adapted to it. <laughs> Turn up to the airport early. <laughs> I make sure, I, yeah, I do need to have a manager. <laughs> However, I, so far I've never missed a gig. <laughs> uh, but anyway, yeah, that's me. Beautiful. I still have a private practice. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And, you know, you, you, you've been demonstrating um, a lot during the course and then setting the participants loose to, to practice, yeah. which has been great. Mm -hmm. um, you've been a physio for a while. Quite a while. Quite a while. 48 years. Right. Wow, 48 years. 
the physio that you graduated as is, it's fair to say, is different to the physio that you are now. Mm -hmm. um, what would you say contributed to your change, the ability to evolve as a physio, to challenge what you were taught, challenge your mentors, challenge the status quo, the establishment, like all of these things would have had to have happened. How did you, how did you manage that? How did I manage that? Um, well, growing up, you know, you keep on, I graduated when I was really young, quite young. I wasn't even 20 years old yet, and I was graduated. So, and it was a two and a half year program, and I went into it right out of high school. And the program was only three years old, and it was fairly unformed as well. <laughs> and so, we had, we spent an awful lot of time learning the wiring diagrams of the machines, and a whole bunch of stuff that's quite useless and boring. Anyway. Um, we also spent a lot of time learning massage. And the basic idea was to train young, young people to be able to, you know, young people with enough energy to kind of keep the medical thing going and work in hospitals and teach people how to crutch walk and get them home again and all of that. That was kind of what it, what it was about, uh, creating independence, getting people back to their lives. And that was the core value system of physiotherapy back in my day when I learned it. And I think that's probably a good one to retain. Uh, I haven't seen the value system, the inherent value system, change that much. I've seen it become eclipsed uh, somewhat by waves of trends that came later. But that core value system is still there. And I stayed glued to it throughout all of this stuff. And um, there were things that came along that I objected to and uh, survived. And all along the whole way, though, I, I was keenly disappointed in the fact that we were not taught people skills in our physiotherapy training. It was all handling skills and management skills and, and um, you know, kind of being operators. You know, here's what you have to do, go do it. And we weren't taught how to be with people or how to help them get over themselves. And that was, for me, a big blank space that was missing. And I went outside the profession and, and got some training on the outside in psychotherapy, in body psychotherapy and various skill sets that had to do with handling people emotionally so that they didn't feel all busted up anymore. So that uh, there was a period of time there in um, the early, late 80s, early 90s when for some reason or other I had person after person come in and burst into tears. Uh, and there I was sitting in this, you know, like, you know, physio clinic with curtains and like, was like not very private and, and I didn't know how to deal with that. You know, it was like, God, what do I do to, I, I, I wouldn't know what to do with them and I would have to say, look, uh, see if you can make another appointment to come back when you're feeling better emotionally. <laughs> So I'd have to send them away because I just didn't have any, anything I could do just then with them. And they weren't in any kind of shape to actually cooperate with what I thought was, you know, physiotherapy. You know, and so it was, the emphasis has always all along been on physical but not therapy, right? I want to see that turn around someday and have us be therapists who also have a license to touch people, you know? And have that, have those people skills, and have the, have the, have a way of being able to s help people sort themselves out carefully, without injuring them more psychosocially. Um, to, to, can be better contained and, um, and help people contain, recontain themselves if they manage to spill out over their containment system that they have psychosocially. <laughs> And you know that's just not part of physiotherapy yet, but one day I hope it becomes a fact. Because people being people, we're going to be have 
breakdowns and moments, and uh, they're going to need some support of a of a good kind, of a healthy kind, of a non-invasive kind, of a of a kind that helps them gather themselves back together. And we don't, as a profession, have that skill set buried in us yet. Hopefully, one day that'll turn around. That's um, so. That's always been a bit of a lack that I see in our work. Whoops, the rest of your question. Did I answer your question? There's more to it? The process of change. The process of change. You know, how did you challenge yourself? In the change? 1980s, along came a huge wave of orthopedic manual therapy, and uh, I was never very... I was always a little distrustful of it, and never really uh, the kind of gung-ho person that would like want to take it on anyhow. I thought I should go and study it in order to know whatever it was about and uh, all that kind of thing. And um, so I did for a while take a few. We had in Canada uh, different kind of levels of it and I took a couple of levels. Never ever got very far. Uh, I bailed after realizing it at a certain point in a, in a particular class that, in fact, it, wasn't, it was relying on palpation of joints and joint movement. And I thought, well, that's, that's not really that good because there's lots of people whose joints you can't even get at your feel. And in fact, the instructor even said, well, you can't really treat, it's really hard to find joint movement on dumpy middle-aged women with cellulite. Anyway, I found that remark <laughs> somewhat offensive. <laughs> What is the point? And of, interesting, though. Well, I mean, what is the point of treating, or what is the point of continuing in this path uh, that leads to manipulative therapy when, in fact, there's a whole pile of people out there that are that are kind of hard to feel joints on, but I know I can already help them with their pain problems. Okay, so this was kind of like the paradox here. What is the point of pursuing this path when, in fact, you can't feel joints on? many, many people. So are you supposed to just not treat half the population or three quarters of the population that have a couple extra pounds on them? But is this only good for thin athletic people or what's going on here? No, this is, well, I just didn't. I thought, what is the point? And I quit pouring any energy into it after that. And I'm gratified to see papers that have come out since that subsequently for a long time now to say that, well, palpation's pretty unreliable and there's no integrated reliability and there's all this stuff and can't really, the SI joints don't really move and all of these things that I, I uh, you know, there was this whole belief system in orthopedic manual therapy that all of this was, it was kind of based on an illusion in a, in a way and on a biomedical kind of train of thinking that all pain came from the body and not from the brain. And, um, Anyway, so I'm, I'm happy I didn't waste any more time trying to learn it or get any black belt in it or anything. <laughs> so, um, and it has ebbed uh, a little bit uh, after the tsunami of it in the 80s and 90s. It sort of ebbed a little bit, which is fine by me because I never was too excited about it anyway. One of my earliest contacts with you was, um, you may not even know. I may not I, remember. Yeah. Remind um, me. Well, you know, Sig Mick, Sigurd Mickelson. Sig Mick, yeah. Um, told me, like it must have been in the, the mid noughties or something, to um, go have a look at um, Soma Simple. Oh, yeah. Um, and, you know, there was a group of you in there, there that was. regularly. We regularly, regularly posted. Yeah, regularly posted and had discussions. How did you find that in, like, I mean, I didn't search long enough about you in particular, but, you know, working together as a group, challenging each other and discussing ideas, how did you find that in your own professional career, having a group of people that I assume you trusted was, and argued with and yes. got on with? and. It was like a training gym for the mind. That's what Soma Simple is. And was, for sure, in 2004 when it began. 
and uh, sort of through the late 2000s, it was uh, until around, 20, well, even after that. So for about 10 years or longer, uh, it was like, a, that's where we practiced arguing. And in a, you know, in a polite way and, and, and kind of like sifting out the wheat from the chaff and um, figuring out what was real and what wasn't and what could be plausible and what couldn't be plausible and a whole lot of things, okay, because manual therapy is full of, full of distorted hypotheses and, and you know, there's, there's things that are masquerading as facts that are based on pure conjecture and just a whole lot of stuff. So anyway, it was all about sifting and, and um, putting things through, through our own filters and then through the filter of reality. Coming to consensus on something and um, helping deconstruct ideas and getting to the essence of those ideas. What did they really mean by that? And all of that stuff. And uh, we found blogs out in the world that were good and brought those there. And it was kind of a gathering place for people who were trying to make sense out of, out of our work. Okay, so that's what it was about, was trying to make sense out of everything, especially to do with manual therapy, which was so full of myth and hypotheses that had never been tested and just everything. So yeah, it was great training. And um, I found, uh, in, th in that process, I found a writing voice. I finally found one. And so without that kind of like verbal jousting all the time, I don't know if I ever could have ended up writing a book or anything. It was like, no, that, that really helped me shape my own um, ideas. Yeah, the value of a peer group that, in an environment that you, I guess, trust and still be yep. vulnerable yet public and yeah, all of that. Yeah, yeah, interesting. Mm -hmm. um, these days, it's much more like Facebook and Instagram and Twitter. Mm -hmm. and yeah, it has exploded. Yeah, social, social media. media. <laughs> Um, what would you say has been the most difficult change in something that you used to do that you that you have changed a lot, almost done the complete opposite? Has that happened in your career? Huh. Give me an example because I'm not sure exactly what you mean. Oh, sure. You used to do this type of treatment and believe the reasons why oh, it worked oh, was The beliefs this. that have changed? Uh, it can oh. be a belief oh, or what you do. Yeah, or, sure. Yeah. Okay, the actual physicality of the actual hands-on stuff hasn't changed that much, but for sure the reasoning and for sure the the I, uh, the um, track that you follow in your mind about what it is you think you're doing. Oh well, yeah, that all no, that, oh, that changed dramatically. Yeah. For Tell sure. us about that change. Well, because manual therapy has been handed down like a craft based on tissue, okay, and based on anatomy and based on all so, so the ideas that it got saddled with were fairly inaccurate. Um, for, for one thing, nobody ever paid any attention to skin. It was like skin didn't exist. And so when you put your hands on somebody, it was like you're feeling muscles, right? But you're not really feeling muscles. You're feeling, you're feeling the body through a thick, layer of skin organ that is like full of nerves and full of blood vessels and full of physiology and and so to it, to subtract all of that from your mind and pretend that you're actually feeling muscles is kind of like inaccurate <laughs> pretty much you're not saying you can't feel under the skin you're saying you can't ignore the skin? I'm saying that you have to take it into account and nobody ever did as they taught I manual agree. therapy to the masses. That's how I was whatever. taught. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and then, uh, you know, and also with fascia, like um, that when you had your hands on somebody that you were actually able to stretch fascia around or something like that, which is impossible. And so anyway, these were, these were the kinds of ideas that were taught along with the hands-on stuff. Hands-on stuff was pretty nice, but the 
ideas that went with it were absolutely inaccurate and uh, misleading and, um, and magical, actually. So that all had to be deconstructed, which some simple was good about doing. <laughs> was it painful? Like to let go of those beliefs? Yeah. Actually, not that bad, you know. After 1998, when Butler had come along with his class, it was like all about the nerves after that. It was like, oh, well, hey, now we can think about something different here. So You already had those lingering doubts for 20-odd years. Yes, and now there was, it wasn't about tissue at all, because tissue doesn't change. It's about the nervous system changing the tissue, if it feels like changing it, but only then, you know, kind of thing. So, it was not that hard for me to get from A to B. My chasm to cross was not that wide, actually. <laughs> Lucky for me, because I'm not a great ath athlete. <laughs> well, it took me three years of constant challenging myself and subjecting myself to, to challenging ideas. So, you know. Yeah. And different people, obviously. Yep. Like there are going to be physios and health professionals and fitness professionals that are going to be cheering because just like you, they've already already had their doubts for so long. Right. Um, and then there are people much more extreme than I who still double down the sunk cost fallacy we talked about yes. last night. You know, they, yeah. they double down on not changing. And they still really adhere to post hoc or group propter hoc. That because I do this and it works, therefore it's a real thing that I'm doing. Correlation, you know. Yeah is the causation in that case, right? <laughs> yeah. That's fantastic. Um, and, and so Soma Simple played a role. Yeah, definitely. Um, how, how have you found your interactions with your clients? What, what do you think the biggest value that people who come to see you get from you is? They get someone who listens to them. They get someone, uh, when someone comes in, I say, okay, now, um, after I get their, the file started and their address and stuff written down, date of birth and all that, the medical legal minimum, I put that aside and I say, okay, tell me about you. Tell me everything about you. And I just give them time. Give them time, give them attention. Let them express themselves however they need to do that. and. Uh, I am uh, confident that I can handle whatever comes up because I'm a fairly mature person now. <laughs> I'm no longer triggered by any of their story. Uh, my story is, doesn't get triggered by their story. My story is like, it's, it's now fossilized, so it's fine. <laughs> and so I can, I can be a, a human being listening to them without, any rea without being reactive which is what people need, I think, is to have someone who's willing to hear them and not going to be put, put knocked off base by anything they might come up with. Okay, and there are so, uh, you know, everybody's got a story and some of the stories are pretty hard to, for people to, I don't know how people manage to uh, adapt to the fact that uh, you know, they've got all these deaths and they've got all this cancer or whatever. You know, like just stuff that's like really hard to, hard to live with, but they do. And people are incredibly resilient and I trust that they can be resilient. Yeah, I do have, if I have any kind of faith at all, it's <laughs> faith that the people are resilient. And that, uh, and so the, the pain that uh, that people have, the physical pain that they come in with uh, for this or that or the other thing is going to be related to that or connected to it but not necessarily a product of that or anything else. It's like, okay, there's, there's all these different, you know, pain sciences full of all kinds of directions you can go in. And the kind that, that I feel competent to treat is mechanical pain like we all are taught how to treat with all of our various hypotheses that mostly are, are delusional. But, <laughs> but anyway, but we do have some skills to treat them, so that's fine. And um, I have learned over the years to just lighten up and do the minimum amount necessary in order to help 
a nervous system change itself over from being a crabby one into being a happy one. And uh, it has to do with nerves and it has to do with moving them and it has to do with helping them recover from whatever kind of entrapment thing they might have had going on. And I've completely like forgotten all about the rest of the tissue in the body. It's like, well, it doesn't matter. It'll heal up by itself. What's important is how that person is feeling about their body and how their body is feeling to them. So to help people feel better in a body, I try to help them learn how to feel their body better. And that's, that's about it. And it doesn't take a lot of strength or effort or anything else. It's all about helping them by explaining to them I'm not going to hurt them. Okay, the physio is full of painful stuff. And I don't think it needs to be full of painful stuff. I think we can survive quite fine treating people kindly, keeping our hands kind and non-harmful and non-hurtful. And, and our demeanor, calm and composed. And our language, um, soft and reassuring. And I think that that's 99% of it right there. And then the skill set doesn't have to be fancy. Just move nerves around a little bit, wait for changes to occur in the physiology of the body. And you can sense that happening under your fingers after after several decades of touching people for a living. It's like, yeah, you, you pick up some nonverbal skills. <laughs> And uh, you pick up receptive skills and and waiting for changes to happen, okay, and not trying to push for them because that does not work because of the way the nervous system is organized and set up. It will find protective mechanisms to block you if you try to force change on the nervous system. So you just instead try to persuade it and that works way better. So if I was to summarize what we've done so far on the course, uh -huh. um, you do the interacting with the client, so you mm -hmm. sit and listen, which by the way, my feedback suggestion to you would be to run a one hour consultation with one of the participants or, or a, an outside client so that therapists can actually see how it all fits together. Mm -hmm. I think that would be really valuable and people would learn a lot from that. So that's number one. Um, so you start with doing the bare legal minimum and then being there with the person, treating them like a human being, yep. um, not being shaken by their story, providing plenty of reassurance, gentle words and language. And, and, and te you, teaching. And teaching, teaching yeah. them about what Just explaining what the nervous system is all about and that they've got one that they're also part of. Yeah, and then, um, and you do that primarily through touch and... Yeah, through, through pictures and, and uh, explaining. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and the mobilizing of the nerves, yeah. you do... I explain that that's what, it, what it's about. But mm -hmm. I'm, Wonder how that is why I want to be touching them and moving their skin around a little bit mm -hmm. yeah. and that it shouldn't hurt it should. and that they have the not only the right but the responsibility to interrupt me if there's any discomfort that gives them um, a, a, a sense of oh okay putting, she's putting me in charge of her oh that's good so then they are more confident that I'm not going to hurt them because the, nervous, the nervous system is selfish and wants to protect itself first. It will protect itself, and but they uh, can then relax and know that they can stop me anytime they want to. Uh, in fact, they're in there with their own nervous system, so I put that onus on them to make an objection if there's any discomfort happening. And it's their job to tell me. Uh, because they're in there with their own nervous system and I can't feel it the way they can. So yes, I give them that job. Beautiful. So that is manual therapy that you're doing? I'm doing hands-on work. Mm -hmm. Yes, yep. hands-on work. As a physio, manual therapy for the profession. There are some that would love manual therapy to die for the profession. 
what what's your opinion on manual therapy then well I think it needs to be reframed seriously reframed I would be very unhappy if it were to be deleted from our profession and out of our scope that we weren't allowed to touch people that we had to instead make them exercise only or whatever like I think that would be a, a very sad day indeed I think that manual therapy is important and it's the only thing that has ever helped me with my pain and I have pain from time to time one shoulder both knees from time to time I've had some serious bouts of pain so I would hate for it to be not a thing um, as soon as it has helped me I've been able to go back to doing what I want to do with myself which is continue working and traveling and doing things and going and buying groceries and carrying them up the stairs or whatever and and just normal daily stuff and um, normal daily stuff is important for people to be able to do effortlessly so I would hate to see manual therapy be not a thing and but it needs some major overhauling oh my gosh all the old ideas that that have been disproven have to be tossed and all of the complicated language that is all about how joints move and all that stuff that's got to go because that's just it doesn't it's all theoretical anyway and people have one person will say this joint moves this way and another person will come along and say no it moves that way so there's like no consensus on how things really move and so that kind of thing for just regular people with regular kind of persisting pain uh, I don't find that useful at all I think that ought to be deleted but not the actual hands-on work okay that has to stay I have a rather controversial opinion about that that I think we may in time come to embrace and it is an evolutionary argument the evolutionary argument it is as follows we as humans are actually fancy primates primates are totally hardwired in fact all mammals are totally hardwired to do social grooming and social contact Primates in particular do social grooming as a psychosocial activity for uh, kinship bonding, for community building, for stress reduction, for all kinds of reasons. It's not just to pick the nits out of the fur. No, it's all about hanging out and getting along and making friends and all that kind of thing. As humans, we've complicated life to the point where con physical contact has become rare. And in fact, our professions of, we have licenses to touch people. And if, and that is one of the only ways that the human community has of having physical contact that is boundaried and non-sexual. And and clear and it's about helping uh, somebody with a problem of whatever sort and so if that were ever to be lost but then we what would we what would we have we would have hairdressing we would have dentistry we would have um, a lot of uncomfortable medical procedures <laughs> you know uh, there wouldn't be much going on for uh, people in pain that would be helpful manual therapy is helpful and it needs to be reframed and and re recoded somehow re, re so that the language around it becomes more clear and concise and accurate and plausible but other than that uh, absolutely we need to keep it in our world what would you say is the most concise accurate um, plausible way of describing, reframing that manual therapy message? What would the ideal message? That it's all about two people being in physical contact with each other in a boundary fashion with two nervous systems that also are in contact with each other in a boundary fashion at the nonverbal level. That's manual therapy right there. And then you can, you know, 
you know, to keep your, your mind busy, you can imagine that you're moving nerves around or whatever it is. But in fact, what's going on at the systems level of the nervous system and the and the interactivity, and the the psychosocial level of the therapeutic relationship, those are the factors that are comprising manual therapy. That's what I think it's all about. Fantastic. Human primate social grooming, with an objective in mind, which is to assist, for the practitioner to assist the person coming to see them and hiring them for their time in their hands and whatever it is they know, and for the practitioner to have make a living uh, and be willing to touch people to make a living, you know? It's, I think it boils down to being that simple. I'm thinking back to what you said about how communication was missing in our profession and, and so you went outside the profession to get some psychotherapy training. Mm -hmm. What would be the key messages that you learnt from that that influenced the therapeutic relationship with your clients? Well, um, mostly it's about dealing with your own stuff, okay? So you get to find out what are your, what, you know, what you're all about and what kind of stuff you're harboring and then you get to process it and have it become less triggery and well better contained and so that it is no longer an obstacle to a healthy therapeutic relationship with another person. That's really what psychotherapy is. Uh, in its essence, all kind, all the different kinds of psychotherapy all boil down to that pretty much. Uh, just work through your own stuff and get rid of it as much as you can, and and you'll never ever get rid of it. But you'll have it become less of a problem and less of an obstacle and less of a of a less of an issue. Then you can help other people with their issue. Beautiful. Thank you. You're welcome. With respect to, um, say, me, mm -hmm. I'm 22 years plus working in the profession now. Mm -hmm. A few things are rusted on. Lots of things have changed. I've seen, I've been around long enough to see things go and then come back, mm -hmm. you know. Um, what would you have for advice for experienced physios, experienced clinicians, and letting you know that I'm going to ask you for something similar for the new graduate or a recently graduated uh, physio. What would your advice be to somebody like me? Been in it for a couple of decades. Where should I go? What should I do? Um, you know, I maybe get, I'm not jaded personally, but I know a lot of my peers are, you know, and, and this whole burnout, this idea of burnout, mm -hmm. and, um, and most recently I discovered a video on moral injury. I thought that was fantastic. Moral um, injury? Yeah. It wow. Said, said don't call, uh, it was a doctor saying don't call what's happening to us doctors is burnout, call it moral injury because of the way that they have to work where they do things against their morals because of the system that they work in, they're not prioritizing the best for the patient. And so inside that causes moral injury to a point where they then have to stop. Uh -huh. It's a very interesting video. Uh -huh. um, I thought it was interesting as a concept. I want to go look into it some more. But, um, <laughs> Whether you agree or not, I don't uh, know. I, but I totally, I totally hear you. It's burnout is something I have experienced <laughs> a few times. Yeah. Uh, serious enough for me to leave the profession oh. for a few years at a time and and do something different for a while. You know, just to see what else is out there. Mm. And but physiotherapy always kept me coming back. I I would miss it when I. After after being away, from, uh, it would get to the point where oh, I can't stand this job anymore. I'm going to quit, and, and then I'd quit and do something different for a bit. And 
at some point there would always be a feeling of missing something. And then I'd go back and get another job and start up again. And physiotherapy always took me back. There was always a new, a new slant on it or a new, a new venue or a, a new place to, to work or a new city to work in or whatever. Anyway, just I'm a rolling stone. I think I've moved, I don't know, it must be like three dozen times in my life or something. It's like I keep going, you know, like wow. the Energizer Bunny, but I keep on not sticking around too long in any one place or any one situation. So, um, I don't know if that answers your question or not. When, For new did, grads, hmm? when, did, when did you first, still on the, the experienced clinician, yeah. when did your first period of burnout occur then? Right away, almost. <laughs> So university I think, burnout. I think it was study. in second year. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, there was no way I could quit at that point. I had to keep going till I graduated, and I, I did. I graduated, um, and uh, and and so I was excited to get out of the <coughs> school of it, uh, thing and into a job. That was exciting. The first job, um, but. Then, then it would get to be a grind. You know, eventually the job would get to be a grind, and I'd move on. And I, bear in mind, I was only 20 years old, so <coughs> excuse me, I still had some growing up to do. Um, I went back to university quite often. I would work like for a few months, make some money, go back to university for a few months, and sometimes for a whole year. I studied a bunch of other things. I never ever got any kind of like academic. Uh, thing achieved or anything. It's just, I just was interested in everything and wanted to know everything about everything. That's all. Um, I actually took pre-med uh, and did okay. Mark-wise, it was fine. But I, then the interviews didn't go that well. <laughs> right, the first interview was in 1970. Or I think 73 or 74. So I hadn't been out of school that long even and I went back to university and took pre-med. I hadn't, I don't to this day understand what I could have been thinking because I would have just, end, had I gotten into medical school, I would have ended up in a hospital forever, right? And I <laughs> didn't enjoy them that much. Anyway, <laughs> but the year that I uh, applied and and I went for an interview. They didn't know what to do quite with me. They asked me to come back for a second interview, and I developed a skin rash and thought, no, I'm under, no, it's too stressful. I think I'm gonna like not go for the second interview. <laughs> there was something in me saying, don't go. <laughs> and it giving came me, out as a rash. It came out as a rash, an acute stress rash. Anyway, so I didn't go, and this rash went away, and it was it must have been the right decision to make. So my nervous system always lets me know what it what opinion it has about stuff, <laughs> even if I dissociate it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, so burnout. Okay, that is such a common thing, and there's not really a whole lot to do about it except get through it and quit quit work if you can for a while you know quit try to get your mind on something else keep moving though keep going and every path will lead back to whatever it is you're supposed to be doing anyhow it doesn't matter what you so all my paths that I you know thought I, oh yeah I can escape this whole grind of teaching crutch walking all the time or whatever you know and but invariably I'd end up back where I left off and keep going with better energy, with bit more fuel, with more uh, drive, with, with um, clearer intent. And uh, I really wanted to be a manual therapist was it's really what I wanted to do. The orthopedic stream didn't interest me. So anyway, I did end up finally be, being able to be the kind of manual therapist that I wanted to be. And it has led to this, and I, it's fine. It's been a good life so far. I'm not complaining about it. And you're not done yet. And I'm not done yet. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm pretty old, and my hands are still in good shape. Yeah. And um, uh, so we'll carry on till we quit, whenever that is. 
Nice. And for the new grad, what, what do you wish you were told as a new grad that you know now? What, what could you impart that doesn't need to be experienced necessarily? My advice would be learn to use your own mind and your opinion is just as good as anybody else's opinion. And yes, it's important to follow your elders to a certain extent, but don't believe everything they have to say because they're wrong just as much as anybody else is. And so trust your own self. As Janis Joplin used to say, trust yourself, you're all you've got. And um, I think that was actually a really good piece of advice that she gave. Because you do, in the end, have to rely on your own best w thinking about what's going on and, who's, and how to do things. And keep reading. Be interested in reading and not just papers in your little narrow field, but read all kinds of stuff and try to get a broad education. Um, don't just stick with, you know, a, a narrow vision. Try to keep the... Uh, I did study art for a couple of years. That's one of my burnout periods was I went and thought, all I want to do is be a potter. <laughs> I want to learn how to sculpt and draw and paint and that's all I want to do now. And I was really fascinated by it and motivated. And I, for, so for two solid years I took art classes and I think I stopped short of getting a Bachelor of Fine Art. I think I had one class left to take, and, but I quit because I wasn't really interested in a degree. Well, you went back to physio. I went back to physio. I did, <laughs> and it, it made me a way better physio. It's very tactile, part of it's right? very tactile, and also visually, like learning to look at people and how they're walking around and what's oh, there's something going on with that person's left hip, you know, and that kind of thing. Just learning to see space and so there was a lot of things about st just studying art that really helped me be, be a better physiotherapy person assessing another person in how they occupy space and how they move in it. Uh, excellent training that way because all we did was sit there and stare at people all day long and draw them and <laughs> um, and this, uh, the actual visual skills and the, and the perceptual, the emphasis on perception rather than on conception. Uh, learning how to, like that's really where I learned to deconstruct was in art school. Okay, this is not how things really look. This is your conception of how it ought to look based on your belief on how it looks. But it's not how it actually looks. Draw, one of the best pieces of advice in art school was this guy who was a, um, fabulous local artist in Regina, Saskatchewan. Anyway, and he said, put your, pa put your pencil on the paper. Don't look at the paper. Look at the thing you're drawing. Start at the outside edge of that where the, pers where the person and the space meet and, and start drawing around the outline of that person. Do not move your hand off the paper. Do not move your pencil off the paper. Make your pencil move at the same speed as your eyes, following the outline, and draw what you see. And don't look at the paper. Just keep drawing around the outside of the form and where the space and the form meet. Draw that, draw that intersection and just keep going all the way around. And so then he said, okay, now look at your picture. Look at him. Holy crap! It looks just like the, <laughs> like the person who was sitting there, and that you're drawing. It's like something happened in the brain. Okay, so it was, it was a brain thing, and it was removing conception and not worrying about how something looks. You're just drawing around, and so it was like a freeing moment. Okay, like you could just stare and look at what was really there and draw that, and all of the all of the masks were gone. All of the learning disappeared. It was all about direct perception and drawing that instead of all this other junk that was in the way. The belief filters, right? The belief filters, they all went away. Yeah. Interesting. Uh, yeah. Yeah. It was really good training. So anyway, I would advise everybody go take art training for a while. <laughs> Not probably that practical for most people, but yeah, it was good. Any last words of wisdom before we end our interview? Words of wisdom. 
do you mean? Anything that you wish for, to say that we haven't said so far? Anything, any burning messages that you like to spread? Oh man, just don't hurt people. Just don't hurt people when you're treating them. And so many of the ways that we're taught how to treat people are actually uncomfortable. Don't do that stuff anymore, you don't need to. Keep it really light. The lighter you are, the less, less is definitely more. The lighter you go and the more kind you keep your hands, the, the better result you'll get. Beautiful. It's been a pleasure and an honor to, to spend the last hour with you. I really appreciate your time and thank you very much for spending the time having a chat. Oh, you're more than welcome. It's been my pleasure. And thank you for being such a good tech support person. <laughs> Always happy to help out. Yeah, okay. Thank you. You're welcome.